next thing we have is a presentation from Michael Bologna. He is the president of Modi Media, and he's going to come up here and uh, share some very, very important knowledge with all of us. So welcome, Michael. I absolutely hate that picture with, with all of my heart. That's you. And that, that is me, but I, but I honestly think I look in that picture like, like some of you do today. <laughs> so, uh, so before we get started, I just want to uh, I want to thank Josh and, and Jeremy and Chelsea and Rick for, uh, for inviting me here. I mean, in my opinion, Videonomics is, is by far one of the absolute best organizations going on in, in our business right now, both in the subject matter we cover and, and in the people that, people that attend. Uh, you know, if anyone was in New York a couple of weeks ago, yeah, please. You know, coming, if anyone was in New York a couple of weeks ago and attended the, uh, the event on television, they would have noticed that that was probably the largest collection of senior television people on the buy side, on the sell side, and on the advertiser side that I've seen in the 17 years that, that, that I've been in the business. And that's, that's, that's a really, really good thing, and I think we need to uh, improve on that. So with that said, what we're going to talk a little bit about today is, is, is television. Um, it's targeted television, addressable television. But before we get into that, I just wanted to spend 60 seconds and, uh, and share a thought that, uh, that a couple of us had yesterday. The theme of this event in every single conversation that I've had has been around programmatic. Now, to be fair, if, if I had my way, everybody would be fined 500 bucks for saying the word because it's, uh, it's, it's, it creates more confusion in our business than I think anything else. But purely speaking from the television side, we need automation, we need data, we need technology, but the debate and the terminology over the word and how it should be used is a big part of what's, of what's, holding, what's, what's holding us up. So a suggestion that a couple of us have for one of the next Videonomics events is a panel called Programmatic Television, Selfish Interests Set Aside. It's gonna be six people, two buyers, two sellers. Yes, Mr. Hortzman, this was your idea and I, I am stealing it, but I'm gonna give you credit for it. Two buyers, two sellers, two advertisers, and we all sit at the table, but as soon as we sit down, we switch seats, and each one of us argues, debates, and discusses programmatic television from the other person's perspective. And I think if we do that, we'll get a much more honest, open synopsis of where we think it should go, and at least from a big agency perspective, that will go a long way in terms of getting us to move our big trucks into taking the television business in the same direction that we've been successful on on the digital side. So with that said, moving on to addressable television. So this is something we've been talking about for years and years and years. The notion of matching data against subscriber files, identifying who's living in the household, sending a commercial just to those homes, deliver, paying only for the impressions delivered to the homes, and ignoring everybody else. That's something we've been talking about for years, right? I think, I think this, is, this goes back six or seven years. What's changed and what's different now, what's never happened before, is there is scale, right? 30% of every US TV household right now has the ability to send a commercial directly to the, to the household level. So the, so the success and the metrics and the, and, the, and the insertion capabilities that we've all enjoyed in the digital space really is here in, in, in the television business space, 42 million households. And you're gonna hear a little bit later today, uh, Adam Gaynor from, from Dish Network is gonna come up and he's gonna share some of his success stories on, uh, on, on the future of television as it relates to targeting. But that's also what I'm gonna do now. Like, we're not gonna spend time talking about the landscape, the marketplace. What I wanna share is, over the past six months, some actual things that we have done. You know, we started an agency in January with 20 of us that do nothing every day but focus on how we're gonna work with our advertisers, how we're gonna refine their segments, and how we're gonna take their television advertising to another level by getting away from that one too many and start shifting to, to the one to one. So within those 42 million households, that is what we're doing. And from a 
targeting perspective, it's a lot further along than anybody thinks, right? So we're not only targeting people based on how much they make or how many children they have or whether or not they're in the market to buy a car or, or, or whether or not they have pets, right? We've heard David Verklin and Canoe talk about households with cats for, you know, for, for, for 10 years now, but we're really getting into purchase level and first party data. We've had seven advertisers over the past six months that have given us their actual customer lists. We've scribed those lists against the subscriber files of you know, the four main addressable providers. We've identified the households within their footprint that fit the names on those lists and we have sent commercials directly to those homes and then after the campaign we have done a post match where we've said these households have seen the targeted spot and these households have actually became a customer and we can do that with a first party list we can do that based on the type of soap that you purchased over the past six months we can do that based on the type of car you're in the market for so so closing the loop in television is something that absolutely is here it's now it's real and 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 advertisers are starting to use it and that's an important thing so what i want to share with you is some of what we've actually started to do when you think about television, we think about Nielsen, we think about ratings, we think about delivery, we think about GRPs, and that's not going to go away. But when you work in an addressable universe, not only do we get actual delivered impressions to a specific household, but we also can track the conversion like we talked about. And we begin to look at the delivered impressions and the conversion metrics by network, by day part, by program. So working in a household level addressable universe begins to help us understand how the overall television business is working. Probably two thirds of every advertiser that's been in the addressable space has taken those learnings and projected it up and utilized the data to, 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 to help guide and directionally influence their, their, their national television uh, investment. And that's really, really important to think that this, that this little, little, little subject that, that's been talked about for, for, for 10 years now is able to, uh, to actually influence a $60 billion business. That's really important. So cutting to the chase, right? No one needs to listen to me talk about what's possible or what we can do. I'm gonna share with you five case studies. Every last one of them is either up and running right now, just finished over the past six months, or within, you know, getting ready to launch over, over the next couple of weeks. This is something we did with a car, and this is really, really important. I don't like to share auto because it's really easy to talk about auto, it's really easy to talk about entertainment, but this was, this was a car company, and we did two levels of targeting, right? We looked at Experian level data, we cherry-picked specific vehicles that were competing brands to this particular automobile, and we identified of those 42 million households, which of those homes were currently in the market to buy one of the specific vehicles that we've identified. And then we sent the messages directly to those households. Then the actual advertiser gave us their sales data, sales of a specific model of a car at the zip code level. So we were able to append sales data with subscriber files and understand which zip codes generate most of the sales. And what we found is that in certain markets, 80 to 90% of our sales were happening in 20 to 30% of the market. And that's really interesting because that allowed us to optimize and manage our investment accordingly. So instead of buying the entire Los Angeles market, we were able to buy 18% of the Los Angeles market because that's where we sold 80% of our $100,000 car. And this works for any advertiser that has a geographic or sales skew. All of that data can be appended. And one of the best ways to optimize or improve what we're currently doing at the local level is by trimming the fat. There's 210 markets. Those 210 markets are made up of almost 3,000 specific insertable ad zones, and, and this is something that, that, that we've seen a lot of success. And then at the end of this campaign, we went back and we said, these households saw the targeted ad, and these households actually purchased the automobile. And we saw, to be honest with you, an 8% lift in sales after this campaign, and it ran for two months. 
So that was a huge success in, in, in our opinion. Getting into the entertainment business. This is nothing new. We've talked a little bit about this before, but it goes to, the, to show the, the, the power of pure set-top box data. So we're able to mine set-top box data, understand which households are watching what on television, and target them accordingly, and then go back on the back end, close the loop, and suggest these households saw the ad, and these households either tuned into a show, or in this case, purchased a movie on demand. I mean, that's never happened in television before. In television, we look at two things. We look at, we look at uh, when we're on air, we're selling products, or we look at what the econometric models suggest in terms of how we're actually uh, converting. But that's not real time, and that's not census level. And, and, and this is, and although this isn't 100 million households yet, we're, we're still on that third level, we are finally able to close the loop, and that's, that's an important part of our business. This gets interesting here. So this is where we took a CPG, right? And most packaged goods, television is the most efficient model. They pay $10 per thousand, they can afford a lot of waste, and, and, and they call it a day. But what this particular packaged goods company utilized was they, they thought of addressability as a means to increase their frequency against a core customer segment. So this happened to be tomato sauce, right? Very, very simple frankly very boring, but we were able to use data, shopping cart data that came from Kantar and Shopcom, match that against the subscriber files, determined of those 42 million households, which ones purchased a competing brand of tomato sauce, and then we sent the commercials just to those homes. Part of that process, we learned two things. We learned, so brand A, B, C, and D, those are the competing tomato sauce brands, so we learned more about our own marketplace or this advertiser's own market than we ever knew before. We know who's buying what. At the end of the campaign, we determined that 3% actually bought our product that never bought the product before. And 44% and, and actually switched. Is the data perfect? No. Is it directional? Yes, but for the very first time in television, this simple packaged goods company selling tomato sauce was able to say, here are the homes to buy the other guy's stuff. Let's send the commercials directly to those homes. Let's pay for only the impressions delivered to those homes. And right after the campaign, let's determine of the households that saw our spot, which of them actually bought our sauce. In addition to that, we act in an addressable universe. It's not about units and shows. It's not about picking networks and programs. And that's something that's hard for big national advertisers to, 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 to grasp. You know, they've spent 6,000 years buying networks and programs and day parts and being very selective from a content perspective. What we're suggesting here is let's identify the household that fits a specific segment and let's do it a little bit less on the content side and more on the audience side, like we've all learned and appreciated and seen value in the digital space. But at the end of the campaign, we see our impressions and our conversions by network and by day part. So this is where this particular advertiser spent about a million bucks on an addressable campaign. They've never come down since. And in turn, they're taking this data, and that's truly allowed them to optimize their I think $175 million national television investment. So they are working together in tandem. And as we went into 2015 media planning, we shaved 3% off of that national television budget and are now applying it to a targeted or addressable television scenario. These are the type of learnings and these are the type of findings that are essential to building the programmatic infrastructure that everyone's been talking about over the past couple days. Fast food, right? Nobody cares all that much about fast food dining. It seems pretty simple. The media mix has been the same for, you know, for, for, for a long time. But this is a particular case where we did two things that are very common in the digital space, yet not so common in the television space. The client had a segmentation study. They sent us that segmentation study. We translated that segmentation using real set-top box data and found that audience within those 42 million households. They also sent us their loyalty card first party names. These are real names that got matched with subscriber files and those homes identified. And then we sent the message. And 
We're still waiting for the back end of this to actually uh, come back and tell us how well it did or, or frankly didn't work. But from a pure cost per thousand perspective, we noticed a 60% decrease in what we call an effective CPM. Whenever we plan a, a targeted television campaign for the advertiser, we, 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 do, we do two things. Once we identify their segment, we map it out what percent of those 42 million. That's the easy part. The harder part for them to understand is what they're paying. Right, so we take that advertiser that's probably paying a $15 cost per thousand to reach, in this case, women 25 to 54, but to reach that specific segment and or the people on that list, that $15 is more like $75, $100, in some cases $200. So when you really show them the economics, when you show them their true cost per thousand in television, factoring in the waste, their eyes pop out They're like, whoa, we didn't know this. So then that shows the efficiency of a targeted television approach. And in this case, the price we paid for this addressable initiative was 67% lower than what that advertiser is really paying it for national television when they factor in the waste. And I guarantee you when we get the results on the back end and it shows how many of the households saw the ad and how many of the households went and bought the sandwich in the store, the numbers are gonna be a lot higher and it'll prove it that much more effective. This one was really interesting. This was, and I'm purposely staying away from big advertisers because everybody talks about big, big, big brands, and they're the subject of every conference, and, and, and that's fine, but I'm purposely focusing on the smaller ones just to show how television can be that much more effective for advertisers that don't necessarily have a $500 million budget. This was very simple, right? Women with kids under a certain age, that was the target. Really, really easy, doesn't sound all that complicated, but at the end of the campaign, what we were able to do is we were able to identify of the households that saw the specific TV commercial, how many of them visited that advertiser's website, we had a unique URL, and how many of them actually searched that brand online. And then the results absolutely speak for themselves. And then in terms of the qualitative metrics, we did a survey before the campaign, and a survey immediately after the campaign. And we saw significant lift in every attribute that, that you see up there. So what, what, what the bottom line with all of this stuff is, for a business that's been pretty basic and simple for, for, for so many years, this new technology is allowing us to do things above and beyond what we ever have before. And the advertisers, big and small, are really, really excited about it. The hardest part, to be very honest with you, is not the technology, it's not mining the data, it's sitting with the advertisers and helping them figure out who they really want to reach. Particularly TV advertisers, they're used to adults 18 to 49, women 25 to 54, but helping them understand who they really want to reach, who their core customers are, then creating the maps to identify how many of those customers live in the country, doing the math to determining if this makes sense that's a big eye-opener for them. What we're finding in general is that if your, cust if your segment is 30% of the US population or less and or your product is over $12, that an addressable approach is almost always an effective and efficient way to do it. If you're talking 40, 50, 60 plus percent, you might as well buy national television. So, these are real case studies. These are happening right now. Big advertisers, small advertisers, and, and, and we believe it's important. And this play, what's missing here is that, is that ugly word again that, that, that no one should talk about, and that's, and that's programmatic. What's missing here is the automation, the, 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 the process infusion that's gonna make this easier. Like I said, I have 20 people that all they do every day is take segments, match data, understand what percent of that 42 million are that particular advertiser sibbing, and that's a whole lot of work. If we had a system, a tool, a platform to where we plugged in women with children under 12, they make over $60,000, and that shot a note out there to Dish Network and DirecTV and Cablevision and Comcast and Time Warner and Charter and all the media owners that have the technology to insert at the household level, it would make the whole process a lot easier a lot quicker, a lot more efficient, and we wouldn't need uh, you know, a village of, of, of 20 to, uh, to 100.
to achieve it. So we have about 10 minutes left. Before I ramble on anymore, questions about this, even about the specific advertisers. I can share more than what I have up here. Yes? Vendor question. Who, who have you, given that the Comcast, et cetera, are, are, are dragging their heels on this, who have you found is good, the best vendors to implement this? So that's a good question. Um, Dish Network, DirecTV, and Cablevision have all been doing this for, for a number of years. Right? They've all been doing it for a number of years. It's not new to them, and they all do it very well. The ch and even Comcast as well. The problem is they do it differently. They all use different technology. They all use different data sets. They all use different third-party metrics. So it's very easy for anyone to call up any one of them and execute a successful addressable campaign. What's not easy is doing it with all three or all four of them, bringing scale, tabulating the data back, translating it to a point that an advertiser can really understand it. That's the hard part, and that's where we need that automation. Anybody else? Uh-oh. <laughs> To get, how many impressions do you need to get a good um, match against, and, and if you don't know, that's fine, we can take it offline, but to, to get a good match against, uh, you know, purchase data, feasibility, yeah. addressable? For most segments, we're finding that a five to seven frequency per week against the segment is what we need to get a solid read on how well the campaign did or didn't work. Um, you know, that goes up when you're talking about a very granular segment. It goes down a little bit when you're talking a broader segment, but that five to seven, that's really what we're seeing. Christy. Hello, sir. Uh, you mentioned the 30%, if you're reaching less than 30% of the U.S. or the price point is over $12, it's a good scenario for addressable. Mm -hmm. Have you seen those campaign situations where it works better, for example, a well-known brand launching a new variant versus a brand new brand or versus a brand maybe with declining sales where they're doing competitive conquesting? So you gave some case studies, but have you seen any consistency in those patterns? You know where we've seen consistency? When we take the time, both the agency and the advertiser, to figure out how we actually want to quantify it, how we want to measure it, then, then, then we're seeing consistency and, and success. What most advertisers don't do well here, or some don't do well per se, or when they make the mistakes, is they use this because they think it's a new toy. They knew it so they can check, they use it so they can check off a box and show their CMO how smart they are in television. And, and from there, at the end of the campaign, we all look at it and say, what did we actually do? Nobody thought about the segment. We just picked one off the shelf. Nobody thought about how well they're actually going to measure it, and that generally results in what's deemed unsuccessful. Anybody else? Thank you very much. Appreciate the time. <laughs>